First Peter chapter number two. We're going to begin reading verse number eleven. And the apostle Peter writes, "Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fr- from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, that they may be, they may by your good works." which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness But as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, in this portion of scripture, the apostle Peter, talking to saved folk, okay, that's who the epistles were written to. First off, he says, dearly beloved, I beseech you. He's begging them. Keep in mind, around this time, okay, roughly A.D. 60, AD 65, somewhere in there. There was a big movement going on all throughout Israel and parts of other parts of the Roman Empire that were speaking of rebellion. And if you are a student of history, that came to fruition in AD 70 when Jerusalem tried to rise up and kick Rome out of Israel and they wanted to be their own nation again. And that didn't turn out too good for them. Uh, go study it out is not good and then after that the Caesar at the time Nero he thought that it was Christians that was causing all the problem and then he started martyring a whole bunch of people that were Christians because he wanted a scapegoat to blame for what all this insurrection was about well what's your Bible say about what God thought about rebellion it says Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And then, verse number 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king, governors, in verse number 14, for it is the will of God. And then verse number 17, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. You know what God said about it? Don't do none of that nonsense. But who's the one that let Caesar come to power? God. Who's the one that let Caesar ordain all the governors? And then if you go further and further and further down the line, our Bible teaches us that no man comes to power without God allowing it to happen. So here Peter writes, granted they had no say in who their rulers would be, but Peter writes, Right? Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Now, what's an ordinance? Well, nowadays we call them laws. Yeah, there would be city ordinances, county ordinances, state ordinances. All of it matters, and that's something that you got to do. Okay, ordinances are non-negotiable. Okay, we'll get to that here in a second. But it says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Doesn't say... Of God, we know we're supposed to submit ourselves to the laws and the ordinances of God. He says, "No, do it to the ordinances of man as well. Not for your sake, but he goes on to say, for the Lord's sake." It says to the king, as supreme, being the one that's in charge. Nowadays, we'd call that a president. Okay, it says then to governors, as unto them that are sent by the king for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So it's talking from the top down. Anybody that was sent with authority, he's saying respect them. Submit yourselves to them. Not for your sake, but for the Lord's sake. Then verse number 60, he says, as free, meaning don't do it like you're a slave to them. No, let them know that you're choosing to do freely of your own choice. That you choose to go out and submit yourselves to the ordinances of man. Not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. In other words, 
well, I don't have to do this, but I am going to do it. I don't agree with this, but I'm going to do it anyway, because that's what the law says. No, it says, don't do it. Do it as a free man. I choose to do this. Not because it's something that I choose to do, but I'm going to do it for the honor and glory of God. Doesn't matter what I feel about it. God said for me to do it, so I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it happily as unto the Lord. Okay, then it goes on to say, verse number 17, honor all men. We like honor some men. We don't like honor all men. You know what that word honor means? It means to give respect. It means to submit to those that have the rule over you, as is written in other parts of your Bible. And to honor somebody means you're not trying to run them down the road. Honor means that you respect that they have the position that they do, and then that you're going to do your best to do what that person asks you to do if they have authority over you. Now, is any of us perfect? No. But if you honor somebody, you're going to try to do your best. You may not do your best, but you're going to try to do your best. That's the difference. Then it goes on to say, love the brotherhood. What's that talking about? Let's talk about the church. You can't honor all men. Or let's flip that. You can't love the brotherhood if you don't honor all men. You say, well, that doesn't make sense, Brother Jordan. I know on paper it doesn't, but let's think about it. Honor all men. Well, if we used to take a look at the brotherhood today, there's a lot of people came from a lot of different places. We all weren't cut from the same cloth. Some of us got different backgrounds. Some of us got different skills. Some of us have different personalities. Some of us, like our pastor and his family, very sarcastic. Okay? People don't understand sarcasm. But what are you saying, brother? If you don't honor all men, you can't love the brother or the brethren. You're going to have an issue loving the brethren if you can't look past what somebody's title is or what somebody's role is or what somebody's personality is. Right? The devil's always trying to drive a wedge into the church. How do you think he does that? He starts picking at things that don't really matter. You know what it takes to honor all men? You've got to be able to look past the things that may irritate you, and you have to look and see what God sees. You can't love the brethren. You can't love church people if you can't see past what's on the outside, because God's still working on that. Right? It's the inner man that binds us all, the new man that God made us into, the one that was quickened, made alive forevermore. That's what binds us together because all of us have the same seal keeping us saved. That's the Holy Ghost. Right? It's that kindred spirit that bears witness with my soul and bears witness to your soul that we're a part of the same family. That's what allows us to come together as a body, as a member of the brotherhood. If you can't look past what's on the outside, you're going to have a real problem loving people. You're going to have a real problem honoring all men. Because what's on the outside isn't much to look at. You've got to look past it and you've got to see what God sees in that situation. Well, it goes on to say, honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Duh. But we go back to the Ten Commandments. God had a lot to say about no other gods before me. He had a whole lot to say about no graven images. He had a whole lot to say about in the law that later came you're not supposed to use his name the wrong way, let alone not respect him and fear him and love him. Well, then it goes, honor the king. Well, he's just stamped it again. He says, don't just honor all men. It's one, anybody ever heard this? Right, this is the old-fashioned argument. It's been happening since the dawn of time. But the argument, well, it's us versus them. No. That's how the world wants you to think. That's how the devil wants you to think. The devil wants you to think that that person's different than you so that you dehumanize them. That's the kind of mentality that allowed a very small nation to end up killing over, that we can prove, six million Jews in a very short amount of time because they saw them as unhuman. They saw them as a disease or an infestation. How'd that start, us versus them? That's very dangerous. Some people see the king, 
or the ruler or whoever has power well he just doesn't understand us we need to get him out of there he's an evil man he doesn't do this he doesn't do that well he's the one that God wanted in that seat he may not be perfect but God's the one that allowed him to be. I'm supposed to honor him does that mean that I have to agree with him no but honor means give due respect if the president signs something into law it doesn't mean that I write it off because of whoever signature is on it no it means that I respect it because of the document that gave him authority that's called the constitution understanding that he didn't sign it in on his own there's a whole bunch of representatives that have to pass it before he can sign it he said brother Jordan this isn't very popular teaching nowadays yeah I know it hadn't been popular throughout all time when Peter wrote this people hated Caesar he was their oppressor he was the one that was overtaxing them he's the one that didn't let them live the way that they wanted to live but guess what wrote the same thing to him as was written to us Peter saying honor the king I know you don't like him it's irrelevant you have to honor and respect him because you can't be the Christian that you're supposed to be unless you honor the king regardless of who the king is is it saying that you gotta bow down and kiss his feet no but you gotta respect him Bible says to pray for those that have the rule over you you really think you're going to pray as God intended you to pray if you don't honor the one that you're praying about you really think that you're going to pray with the passion and with the fervent right intention that God wanted you to have if you don't honor or respect the person that you're praying about Bible says pray for your enemies but in order to pray for somebody you got to respect them what was the first part of this verse? Honor all men. I get it. There's people that their personality just rubs you the wrong way. There's evil people. Right? There's people that's demon possessed. The Bible says honor all men. What do you, Brother Jordan, that don't make much sense to me. I'm not saying join up with them. I'm saying view them the way that God views them. When I look at another human being, they may be the most wicked person in the world, that's still a soul that God breathed life into. That's still a person that God, from the alpha of time, has loved them with an everlasting love. They're just as much human as I am human. Doesn't mean that they're making the right choices. Doesn't mean that they're living the way that I approve of or that God approves of. But it does mean that I have to see them as a human being in order to go out and witness to them effectively. I can't see them as a thing. I can't see them as something that's evil or something that's corrupt or wicked because then I'm going to write it off. They may be all those things, but they're also a person that God loves. You want to know one of the things nowadays, it happens all the time at work. I was raised, if it's a woman, it's yes ma'am, no ma'am. If it's a guy, it's yes sir, no sir. And if you don't know, you just don't talk to it. But some of y'all get that later. But all the time on the phone at work, I do it in the drive thru. I went through a drive thru Saturday at the window. It was like 14, 15 year old high school girl. You want, you know, I think I can't remember what she asked. And I said, no ma'am. And she was like, what? I'm like, no, please. Caught her off guard on the phone all the time at work. Oh, you don't have to call me ma'am. Well, if it's a her, I call it a ma'am. And if it's a him, I call it a sir. Like, it's just, I can't help it. I just do it. Don't even think about it anymore. When was the last time that somebody held a door open for you on the way into a you know, gas station or anything? When was the last time you did it for somebody else? You want to know why those things are going the way of the dodo? Because people don't honor or respect people anymore. It's all about them. I'm not going to stop and hold the door open for you. I got places to go. Right? What was the last time? Uh, used to, one time, I can't remember, it was about a year and a half ago. There was like a winter storm that was supposed to hit overnight, but it came a little bit early. 
And because people are people and they trusted the phone, I don't know why you'd do that, or the weatherman, nobody brought ice scrapers or anything else with them to work that day. Guess who had one? Me. Right? We got some old ladies. Right? They, I mean, they're healthy, but they're not running marathons. Okay? Went out, scraped the ice off of the windshield. Before it blew them away. I'm like, that's just, I don't care that you're ladies. Like, if nobody had an ice scrape, I'd at least let them borrow mine. I'm not going to make them do it by hand. Right? One guy's out there trying to do it with a credit card. And I'm like, one, you're going to ruin that card. And two, here, I'm already done. Honor and respect in people, it's abnormal nowadays. You wouldn't cut people off in traffic if you respected them. I'm just being honest. If you respected them and you really cared about how, the, you know, well, I want that person to be safe, you wouldn't leave that much room between your bumper and theirs. But if you honor and respected somebody, regardless of how you feel, right, you wouldn't be brake checking people on the interstate. Not talking about just talking to people in general. We're talking about silly things. I'm talking about in the past couple of weeks, I've heard several accounts of people that were driving down the interstate. Somebody got angry, and at the next red light, guy pulled out a gun and shot at him. You really think that if you're cutting people off, in, or if you're not cutting people off in traffic, that you're going to get so angry that you're going to start shooting at somebody? Right? It's a progression of the times. The Bible says that before the Lord comes back, it's going to have to get as evil as it was on Noah's day. Well, how evil was that? Evil, more evil than it was today. Because the Lord hadn't come back yet. It's got to get worse out there. Well, what in the last days? Aren't we supposed to be more fervent? Aren't we supposed to be ever looking towards the Lord's imminent return? Knowing that as bad as it gets out there, it just means he's getting closer and we're running out of time. Well, here the Apostle, Apostle Peter he says, Dearly beloved, in verse number 11, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. You want to know a crowd that's always under the microscope? A crowd that's just traveling through? Everybody knows they're not driving stakes in. They're not here to stay. They're only here for a little bit. We want to make sure that they don't mess up what we got while they're here. Right? If they get a little loud, we're calling the cops on them because we want to sleep tonight. Right, if they leave a little bit of trash behind, we're going to find them so that they don't do it again. Right, we don't want them just blowing through town and then leaving it a mess on the way out. That's always the pilgrims. It's always the strangers that are under the microscope. Because, one, it's something new. They already know all the dirt on everybody around them. There's somebody new to find dirt out on. Right, there's a little bit of novelty to it. But also... It's one of those, well, it's us. We belong here, and they don't. Uh, you want a good example? Go watch First Blood, first Rainbow movie. You want to know why they treated that guy the way that he did? Because he wasn't a part of the town. They didn't care that he'd just come out of the military. They didn't care that he had not been able to hold down a job because of the things that were still bothering him about his Vietnam service. They didn't care about none of that. They just saw him as a bum. All he was trying to do was walk through town, maybe get a plate of food, pay for it, and then just keep on passing through. But why was it easy to take advantage? Because he's not one of us. So he says, Dearly, I beseech you as pilgrims and strangers, as the crowd that's always under the microscope, as the part of the crowd that doesn't belong to this world, Everybody else is always looking at you and thinking, well, it's one of them. That's not one of us. He says, as part of that crowd, he says, first abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Now, there have been enough preaching around here in the past month, and then no telling how many times throughout all them tape racks back there and the ones that you all don't see no more that Brother Randy has up in the crow's nest that's the backup records if anybody hey you got this and then he's got to take the tape and turn it into a cd and then every now and then he's got to go get an eight track and 
You know, he, he's always trying to convert something over. Right, there's a record of what's been preached around here. More important than that, there's a record of everything that's been preached around here in heaven. You're going to have to give an account for it. What you did with what was preached out of this pulpit. He's saying, all those fleshly lusts, you know what they do? They keep you from being what you're supposed to be for the Lord. So the first thing is he's begging you, be what you're supposed to be for Jesus. But then he goes on to say, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. He's beseeching you that you live right so that your testimony before those that are looking at you under the microscope, when they put you under the microscope, they see something that's real. He's saying, if you're going to be under the microscope and when they look at you, all they see is what they see in themselves, they're not going to pay attention. They're going to write you off. But he says, if every time that you come rolling through as a pilgrim and a stranger, well, there goes that guy. He's not one of us. Don't judge the Lord. You do the same thing. If you're used to you know, a group of regulars at a restaurant, and all of a sudden somebody comes in, they look a little worse for wear. Everybody turns and looks. Right, A couple of guys move their chairs around so that they can keep an eye on them. What are they doing? That's, he's not one of us. You know the one place you should never find that? The house of God. All should be accepted. Doesn't mean that all are a part of it. Doesn't mean that you's hooked up with the trait, but you should feel welcome. Doesn't mean you should feel at home. You're not going to feel at home until you get saved and you get made part of the family. But you should feel welcome. Well, he says, Gentiles, they're going to keep you under a microscope. Have your conversation honest among the Gentiles. That, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, that by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. In other words, they're going to talk all manner of bad about you. But when they put you under that microscope, if your conversation is true and your conversation reflects what the Lord wanted you to do and what the Lord wanted you to be, then they'll have to change their story about you. They may talk evil about you now, but in the day of visitation, was that when the Lord come? Their testimony will be to your credit. It'll be to your good. Well, verse number 13. Talking again, remember, he's talking about having an honest conversation before the Gentiles. Why is that so important? Because while we are here in this world, there's going to be those that talk evil about us, but if you live the way that the Lord wants you to live, it really brings praise and glory to God. Because those that are without God see that you have God, then they desire God, and they get in, become part of the family. You want to know why the, world, or the church is so ineffective today in the world? Because people from the church look, act, smell, talk like the world. Well, Lord, I pray that you'd save that person. Well, maybe it'd be a whole lot easier for the Lord to save them if you lived the way that you're supposed to. Maybe it'd be a whole lot easier for the Lord to send somebody by their way to plant and water if you're the one taking seeds in the water pot with you. Right in our day and age, we live in the world that if I want something, I tell Amazon and then it shows up at the longest two days later. And there's some places you can get the same day. <clears throat> That's weird. From the internet to your house in less than 24 hours. That's weird. Right, but we live in the day if I want food, pull out the phone or go through the drive-thru and boom, food. In fact, you get long if food takes longer than five minutes in the drive-thru. You know how in order for that to be true, you're what you want old food. Right? In order for them to make it that quick, it had to be ready already, which means you don't want fresh food, you just want it fast. And then you're going to complain about, oh, well, that wasn't the best burger. You wanted it before you showed up. You wanted them to have the bag out the window. How do you think that's going to happen? You can either have something cheap, good, or you can have something uh, subpar. Right? Well, if you want it cheap and good, it means you're going to have to wait for it. 
you want it cheap and subpar, that means you can have it right now. Right? Or if you want real food, you've got to pay more for it, and it's going to take a little bit. But it's up to you. That's the mentality that we have. So what do we think? Well, if the Lord's going to save somebody, Lord, just save somebody. No, there's work that goes into people getting saved. You know what it takes? Well, it takes an honest conversation from you amongst those that are lost. How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear unless the word is lived out in front of them in the world? Jesus was the word made flesh, according to John chapter number 1. The word came and dwelt among men. Every day that he lived, it was a testimony, an honest conversation among the heathen, right? God's chosen people and God's, or those that were Gentiles, those that were without God, it was a testimony to them, a good conversation of what God expected from them. And word got out. Word got out with Peter and the apostles. That word got out with the apostle Paul. Whether it was with his missionary trips to Silas or Barnabas. The word got out. People's coming from all over to hear about Jesus. Coming from all over to hear about what's going on in these churches and minor and greater Asia. What's going on in these places? They had an honest conversation. They knew who they were, they knew who the other was, and they knew who God was. And they lived accordingly. Well, if you want an honest conversation, God says... Then in verse number 13, you need to submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Willie Nelson found out a hard way that you don't rob the IRS. Okay, so did MC Hammer and a whole bunch of other people. You know why the IRS always gets their, their payday? Because one, this building needs a retirement plan. But two, they always get the money that they're owed because it's a law it's against the law to not pay your taxes well according to your bible you're not supposed to just obey the laws but the ordinances if you know that it's against the rules to park on this street after 6 p.m. like on a Monday through Friday or whatever it is don't park there I don't care that you can get away with it don't do it. Like right, if somebody's watching you. Somebody's going to see it. They always do that. Drives me up the wall. You really think you're going to win that person to the Lord? This is probably going to kill the whole services today, but God said to say it. You ready for this? And granted, I'm guilty. From my own mouth, you've heard me behind this pulpit say that I do this, but I've been working on it been the most stressful week of my life inside of a car because of what I'm about ready to say Brother Tommy it's against the will of God and you can't be right with God if you speed what's the speed limit that's an ordinance but is it not it's a law what's, it, what's this verse say verse number 13 submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake Every. You know what every means? All. You know what all means? All. It means all of it. Well, speeding. Why were speed limits put in place? One, because back in the day, people were stupid and they didn't have seat belts. So if you drove a car too fast and you in a wreck, you're probably going to either out the front windshield or because you're sliding around in one of them big old battleships that were made out of solid steel, right? If that thing flipped over, it was like you being put in a blender. Okay, there were speed limits that said if you don't drive too fast, people can't die. Well, then that didn't work because people didn't follow the speed limits. Then they started doing things like seat belts, okay? Then they had airbags, okay? More things to make you safe. But guess what? Speed limits are still there. Speed limit is there because somebody somewhere, I'm, I'm not saying that they're not wrong, okay? But somebody somewhere in a room decided that, oh, on that road, it's unsafe to drive faster than this. Well, you don't know what car I drive, okay? You made that speed limit for a 1960 Buick, 
okay? And nowadays, I got things called suspension, okay? Cars can turn nowadays. They can stop faster than that. I don't have drum brakes. I got disc brakes, okay? I understand that my car can stop quicker and can probably turn at a faster speed, but they haven't changed the speed limit. You know what that means? God said drive the speed limit. You know what really the speed limit boils down to? One, you agree to follow it because God said so. But two, I drive the speed limit because if somebody, God forbid, should fall out in the road, I want as much time as possible to slam on the brakes and not hit them. If somebody were to cut me off, they may be a jerk. But just because you're a jerk doesn't mean that you need to have your car totaled. Doesn't mean that you need to go to the hospital because I was driving too quick to slam on the brakes. You know what obeying the speed limit boils down to? One, honor for God. Honor for those that have the rule over you and the ordinances that they passed. And honor for your fellow man. What's this chapter boil down to? Verse number 17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. If you do them four things, you'll follow the speed limit. I know, hey, we talk about worst week of my life. Trying to drive speed limit. One, foot is used to go into one spot. Two, when you drive slow, people get angry. Okay, three, they try to go around you. Okay, first off, it didn't help that one day I hit the button that made it go from a mile an hour to uh, kilometers an hour, and I was wondering why I felt like everybody else was in the NASCAR race. It's because I was driving too slow. Okay, that was, that was bad. Because then I flipped it back over, and I'm like, oh, well, yeah, no wonder they're all driving past me, because they were just doing the speed limit, and I'm over here driving in European numbers. Right? It's slower. Yeah, I slowed down for a school zone, and I'm looking, and I'm like, these cars are driving way too fast. This is dangerous. And then I looked, and I'm like, oh, kilometers. That'll do it. But, but it's stressful. Well, what if I'm late? I'd rather be late and right with God than early and not. Just being honest. Well, goes on to say, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto the governors. Well, the Bible says I have to respect the president, but it doesn't say nothing about the senators. It? Nope. It says, submit yourself unto right, the king as supreme or unto the governors. It doesn't talk just about the 50 state governors. A governor is somebody that has authority to do something. Whether, and it's of this verse that defines that authority as whether to punish evildoers or reward those that do good. Authority has been given unto them for a certain point, right? A purpose. Well, why do we elect representatives? So that they can cast a vote on our part to ideally pass bills that are in the best interest of the people from the state of Kentucky. Right? They have been given authority to either do for us or do against us because of our vote. Kind of sounds like a governor. What's a mayor? Somebody that's been given authority over a city. Right? What's a governor nowadays? Somebody that's been given authority over a whole state. Well, what's a, a sheriff? That's somebody that's in charge of punishing people for a whole county. What's a deputy? Somebody that goes out and writes the tickets because the sheriff can't do it all on his own. Now what's a police officer? That's somebody that from a city has been entrusted with the safety and well-being of the people of that city. What's a firefighter? Somebody that's volunteered their time, their effort, and most of their life in order to go out and help those that are in harm's way. They've been given authority to kick down the door of somebody's house if it's on fire. So don't get angry that the firefighter, you know, parked the truck to where you can't get to your house, sit there and be patient. Somebody's life's on the line. We're supposed to respect, not honor those that have been given authority. Why? Because the Bible doesn't want you ruffling feathers. I honestly believe 
Okay, that nowadays, what they talk about, all these rednecks out in the woods talking about we're going to have a militia, right, and we're going to storm and take over the government. I don't believe that's the will of God. Until such a time as there is tyranny, right, that's where instead of somebody being given power, they take power. That's the difference between a tyrant and an elected official. But so long, as according to the laws of our land, right, they're still doing it the right way, I don't think it's right. In fact, I think you should be out there trying to support them. Hey, you know what? I've run you down for years. What can I do to help you? You don't know why places used to be a good place to live because everybody pitched in. Everybody was united in one goal. That's let's make our city the best city. Right? Or let's make our street the best street. Let's make our church the best church. And people bought into it. They honored and respected one another. Right? No wonder no decent person wants to run for political office. Right? They'd see all the people getting run down and beat up and everything. Ben Carson, probably the nicest dude and also the smartest dude that's ever run for president in the past 40 years. They talked about him like a dog. He's a doctor. He's supposed to go out and do doctor things. You don't judge a doctor by what a you know, lifelong politician should look like. He was just somebody who had the best interests of people at, at heart. And you know what? I trusted him. You know why? Because his whole life was a pattern of works that he wanted to do what was best for people as a doctor. Didn't matter what was given. He stayed in surgery one time for almost like two days to separate conjoined twins. It wasn't about what was best for him. It was what about best for other people. I want somebody like that in office. Right? Decent people get eaten up, spit out, or get scooped up, chewed up, then spit out. Why? Because, well, we don't want that person in office. They don't have any experience. They don't know what they're doing. I'd rather trust a good person that doesn't know what they're doing than a bad person that does. But nobody wants, why? Because they know they're going to have to go through the grinder in order to even get the position. Right? No one, you know what I mean? I don't know how we got on this, but now we're here. You know, in the first couple of decades of our nation, right, people like George, George Washington had just spent like 30 years trying to do his best to serve first as a military leader. Then he retired, and then he went and became a farmer, and then they said, ah, we kind of need help, so he put, he'd come back again. Then he fought the revolution. Then they elected him president. He did that for eight years. You know what he did after that? He went home. He didn't hang around and stay in Washington. He didn't keep writing letters to the next guy saying, hey, this is what I think you need to do. But you want to know what happened after a certain amount of time? Most of them would go home. They'd say, I did my civic, civic duty. Right? Y'all wanted me to come and do this because y'all thought I was pretty good at it. But I did it and I'm done. It's time for the next guy to go. It wasn't just a, you get in and then you stay in. It was a, everybody has to do it. We all need to take turns. Why? Because it's all of our responsibility. That's gone away. Right, of T-Rexes. It's extinct. Those that want the best for people nowadays can't hack it in a world that's meant to devour other people. People that have good natures right, are easily scared away from something that looks intimidating like that. You know what could fix all that? If on Main Street people just started honoring and respecting God, honoring and respecting other people, Honoring and respecting those that have authority over us. Why? For the Lord's sake. Not for your sake. Not for our nation's sake. Not for your family's sake. For the Lord's sake. You know what would help out a whole lot? If more people got saved. If people start getting saved, they go tell other people that they got saved. What happened? More people get saved. Enough people get saved, eventually saved people are going to get into positions of authority. I believe some's already there. But, where they're hitting, 
If you get more of us into authority, guess what? You got more people honoring and respecting and doing ads unto the Lord. Guess what? That's going to change things. It's going to turn things around. You know where it starts? With you following the speed limit. You think I'm kidding. But in truth, that's, it's kind of true. It starts with you waiting for the little white guy to turn white instead of the red hand before you cross the street. Because that's the law. Well, there's no cars coming. It's the law. Said by Jordan, that's a, that's a little inconsiderate. No, I'm just saying that's the rules. Well, I didn't write the rules. No, but God allowed the one that did write the rules to get into office. If you honor God, you got to honor the rules. If you honor God, you got to honor other people. That means that even though there's a car coming and you think you can make it, you're not going to run out there because you don't want to give that guy a heart attack. Right? You wait until the coast is clear. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. Because it's the respectful thing to do to other people. Because that's how you would expect other people, if the roles were reversed, to treat you. You want to know all that he talks about here? Okay, verse number 15. This isn't my opinion. For so is the will of God. You know what God's will is? For you to follow all the ordinances and for you to respect people that have been given authority. To honor them. That means if they say something, you say, okay. Doesn't mean that you bow down and worship them because they have a political office or because they have a local office or because they've got a badge on. It just means yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. I'd like to lodge a formal complaint that I do not agree with this, but I will comply with it because I understand that it's an ordinance. You don't have to agree with it and it doesn't say that you have to like the way that it is, but you do have to respect it until it's changed. It means that you have to do as unto the Lord. It means as free men, right? Not being under a bond of maliciousness or a cloak of maliciousness. Right? Some people, they walk around and they follow rules with their head down. Well, I don't like it, but I have to do it. Well, there's a whole big difference between that and just because I don't agree with it doesn't mean that I can't do it as unto the Lord. You think Jesus wanted to come, be wrapped in a robe of flesh, and to be tormented the way that he was on the cross? You think he enjoyed that? No. He suffered for our sakes. So for the Lord's sake, I'm willing to suffer a little bit of indignation I'm willing to sit there and have high blood pressure because the guy behind me is honking the horn at me because he thinks I'm driving too slow. I'm willing to suffer all manner of indignation and insult and injury for the Lord's sake. And when people ask me, well, why do you do that? Because that's what I believe God told me to do and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Now, sometimes I don't pay attention and the foot gets heavy and then I look down and, oh, got to slow down. But there's a difference between mistakes. There's a difference between, well, Lord, I forgot, I'm sorry, and a pattern of you just not caring. You know why people don't respect the world? Because they don't respect God. You don't know why people want to hurt police officers nowadays? Because they have no understanding of respect that was instilled in them for the things of God and for other people. You want to know why people want to go against this group and that group? Because it's us versus them. That mentality. But according to God, honor all men. Fear God, first and foremost. But honor all men. Honor the king. Do all that you do as unto the Lord. But, more importantly, do it as a free man. Somebody that chooses to do it. No, I don't have to do this. I choose to do this because it's an honor to do things for my Lord. There's always somebody out there trying to pull the, hood, the wool over somebody's eyes or hoodwink them, trying to get away with this, that, or the other. Well, if I do this, then I can write off this much more on my taxes this year. 
Right? If you buy this book and listen to it for 48 hours, right, it'll teach you how to save 12 cents on your tax return. Well, how about instead of buying that audio book and listening to it for 48 hours, how about you spend that in the Word and witnessing, and I promise you God's going to take care of all the paperwork in the end. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I'll give Caesar what he says I owe him. Because I've already given what I owe God, and God said if I give unto him, he'll take care of all my needs. So I'd rather do it with honor for God and honor for others. Because it's not about a bank check or a bank account. It's not about a paycheck. It's not about all these things that the world's caught up in. It is about you being a good and honest conversation in the world. That regardless of what it is that you do, you do it with honor and respect for God and for other people, and they're going to take notice because they're all about themselves. They're all about, well, let's talk bad about those that do good and run them down the road. But if you just keep doing good, then they got to stop and pay attention. All of a sudden, they realize that you may be a pilgrim and stranger, but they want to go to where you're headed. It all starts with honor and respect. You know why people in their day wanted to overthrow Rome? Because they didn't honor and respect the Romans. They thought that, saw them as captors. They saw them as people that were enslaving them and keeping them in bondage. They didn't see them as humans. And in the year AD 70, Jerusalem, they rose up. They killed a whole bunch of Romans. Well, what happened? A whole bunch of Israelites died shortly thereafter. Because it was an us versus them thing. And so Rome turns around and says, fine, they want to fight. We'll fight. They had the biggest army, in, in compare, one of the biggest armies of all time. When you compare population sizes. What did they do? They raised the city of Jerusalem. They wiped it out. You know where all that came from? Lack of honor. Lack of respect. But most importantly, they didn't see others as God saw them. They saw them as they wanted to see them. That's my enemy. No, that's somebody that's lost on their way to hell. And if you honor them, you'll at least have enough love for their soul that you'll tell them about the Lord. But if you honor somebody, you're also liable to love them as God loves them. And then it's not just doing what the bare minimum is. Then it's you're going out of your way to tell them about Jesus regardless of what it costs you, regardless of how long it takes, and regardless of what it may mean for you. You're going to go through whatever just for what's best for that person. That's how Jesus dealt with you. He didn't think about what was best or convenient for him. He did what you needed and nothing less. You really think you're going to do what others need if you don't respect them? No. You really think you're going to look at other people the way that God looks at them if you don't fear God? No. You really think you can go out there and live with a good conversation if you don't respect those that have authority over you? No, you're going to be a hoodlum. Right? But God said you can't have a good conversation. Starts first with denying those lust of the flesh. But then it's every day consciously saying, I'm going to follow after the Lord with honor and respect for other people. Have a good conversation. Or in other words, a good testimony. So that regardless of what I find myself in, they can talk as bad as they want to about me, but one of these days they're going to have to admit I was right. And to suffer it all with joy in my heart because I'm fulfilling the will of the Father. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.